Tyrannosaurus rex, the most famous dinosaur the world over, has captivated the public for more than a century. It's undoubtedly responsible for a significant number of people developing a fascination for paleontology and our planet's past. It's also definitely been the subject of numerous nightmares inflicted on dinosaur-obsessed children. I speak from personal experience here. The fascination with this animal is absolutely understandable. T-Rex was a truly awesome and impressive creature. Tyrannosaurus has also been at the centre of many debates and controversies over the years, with paleontologists loving to argue over this dinosaur. The extent of feathering, soft tissues, locomotion speed, nanotyrannus, the dreaded lip debate, all fun things to talk and think about. But until now, no one had really seriously considered that there might be more than one Tyrannosaurus species, it had always been Tyrannosaurus rex, the Tyrant Lizard King. But of course, you've forgotten that the year is 2022 and literally anything can happen at this point. A new paper has just been published that proposes not one, but two new species of Tyrannosaurus should in fact be recognised. This means that, in addition to T-Rex, there's now T. Imperator and T. Regina, the Tyrant Lizard Emperor and the Tyrant Lizard Queen. Now, this is a fascinating and complicated idea, and in the end it's really going to come down to what a researcher considers a species to be. This may seem like a relatively simple thing to answer, in biology we have a fairly good idea of what defines a species, a group of reproductively isolated organisms that can interbreed to produce fertile offspring, but obviously when it comes to extinct organisms, this is a bit of a problem. That's why paleontologists in general adhere to something called the morphological species concept. The idea that organisms that are very similar in shape and various aspects of anatomy can be classified as the same species. It makes sense, organisms that look alike are generally going to be members of the same species. But, of course, the fossil record has to complicate things. With incomplete remains of fossil taxa, coupled with the natural variation in anatomical features that occur within a species or between populations, making this a very difficult and somewhat subjective practice on occasion. So, what does that have to do with the new Tyrannosaurus paper then? Well, paleontologist Gregory S. Poole and colleagues have argued that the differences in the bones of various Tyrannosaurus specimens are different enough to warrant their classification as separate species. Therefore, they propose the idea that a slightly older ancestral Tyrannosaurus species, T. Imperator, gave rise to two younger species that then coexisted with each other, a robust species, T. rex, and a gracile one, T. regina. As a concept, this is not a completely unreasonable suggestion. Indeed, it can be argued that it's actually expected, considering how long the Tyrannosaurus genus seems to have existed for and how geographically widespread it was. The paper explains how estimates put Tyrannosaurus as having been alive for between 1.2 and 3.6 million years, a vast span of time over which species level evolution could most certainly have occurred. Supporting this argument is the point that, over the same time span, the contemporaneous genus Triceratops appears to have produced multiple species, with the older Triceratops horridus giving rise to Triceratops prorsus, as well as a potential intermediate species existing between them. The paper also gives the example of the splitting of the Panthera genus based on DNA analysis, with the lion and leopard lineages separating from each other only one to one and a half million years ago. So yes, it's definitely enough time for an animal such as Tyrannosaurus to speciate. The problem that a lot of paleontologists have had with this paper so far though, is the actual evidence that the species level split has been based on. A very valid criticism of the paper that, in my personal opinion, makes this specific argument not particularly compelling, is the fact that really only two key differences between Tyrannosaurus specimens have been identified. The first of these is the robusticity of the specimens, that is, the overall thicknesses of the bones themselves. In some Tyrannosaurus specimens, the bones have been noted to be significantly more robust than the same bones in other similarly sized specimens, particularly the femur, the upper leg bone. This did lead to some researchers in the past suggesting that this was evidence of sexual dimorphism, or that the more robust forms were individuals that grew to be older in age. Some paleontologists also suggested that these differences were simply the result of natural variation between individuals of the species. However, this new study uses the differences in robustness as the main point in favour of these specimens representing separate species. A second difference used as an apparent way to confirm the presence of three species is seen in the dentition. In some specimens, there are two small incisiform teeth present at the front of the dentary bone of the lower jaw, with the tooth next in the series behind them being significantly larger. Meanwhile, other specimens have only one small tooth at the front, with the second tooth being much larger. 
This difference in teeth may not seem like much of an important variation, but the study uses it as a potential way to independently validate the multiple species hypothesis by stating that if this difference correlates with the robust or grey cell morphs, it could be a second indication of these being separate species, since they possess another difference in morphology. So the authors of the paper set about calculating the relative robusticity of 38 Tyrannosaurus specimens by measuring the proportions of their femora, as this bone is considered to be a good representation for overall robustness of the animal, as it was one of the main weight-bearing bones. The authors found that there is indeed an unusual level of variation within the femora of Tyrannosaurus when compared with the variation seen in other large theropods, namely Allosaurus, Gorgosaurus, Albertosaurus, Dospletosaurus, and Tarbosaurus. Interestingly, Tyrannosaurus femoral proportions have a greater variability than the variation between all sampled Albertosaurus, Despletosaurus, and Gorgosaurus femora too, with the paper suggesting that this greater variation could support a species level split, though of course it's still important to consider that perhaps other factors were having an effect on Tyrannosaurus which did not influence these other taxa. I'm not saying I know what those might be, but those particular Tyrannosaurs are all quite different to Tyrannosaurus itself. So what about the tooth morphology? Does it correlate with robustness? Well, yes it sort of does apparently. The paleontologists found that there was actually a significant correlation between having one small tooth at the front of the dentary and higher femoral gracility. However, some robust forms also possess just one small tooth too. That brings us to the issue of stratigraphic range. The study also found that the grey cell Tyrannosaurus form is stratigraphically limited to the upper horizons of the range in which Tyrannosaurus fossils have been found, with just one form from the middle zone definitely being grey cell and all other grey cell bones only being found in upper zones, meaning the grey cell form lived relatively later on. Therefore, the authors propose that an older, more basal species, Tyrannosaurus imperator, that was robust and possessed two small incisiform teeth at the front of its dentary, gave rise to the younger T. rex, a robust species with usually just one small tooth at the front, and T. regina, the grey cell form that also usually had one small tooth. So, under this new classification, famous specimens such as Sue at the Field Museum is now Tyrannosaurus imperator, Stan and Black Beauty are Tyrannosaurus regina, while the T-Rex holotype at the American Museum of Natural History, along with specimens such as Y-Rex, are still Tyrannosaurus rex. However, quite understandably, this paper and the evidence presented within it has come under quite a bit of criticism from other paleontologists, and especially from T-Rex specialists, who are not at all convinced by the argument. One of the main criticisms is the fact that the data itself is very sparse. Now, a point put forward by the lead author of the paper is that other dinosaur species have been named on less data. And while that's true, it's usually the case that these other dinosaurs are obviously very different to the dinosaurs previously found in the region or at that time, even if they're based on very incomplete remains. But that's not the case with T-Rex. Many nearly complete skeletons of this dinosaur are known to science, and so all sorts of anatomical characters of the bones have been recognised and are able to be scored in data matrices that can then be analysed, allowing the overall similarities and differences between the entire skeletons to be compared. So, as Tyrannosaur researcher Dave Hone has pointed out, if there were indeed three distinct clusters of Tyrannosaurus specimens when all of these characters are analysed in a matrix, then sure, there's some good and pretty compelling evidence for three potential species. But that's not what was done in the study. Instead, only one main difference was investigated, the thickness of the femora. The difference in teeth may not even be a significant variation either, as Dr. Hone also points out that a variability in tooth number has long been considered a natural variation within T. rex anyway. Plus, reptiles in general often have varying tooth counts within a species. Another key criticism of the paper is the fact that the sample size is just far too low. Unfortunately, this is always likely going to be a problem for dinosaurs such as T. rex, as there's only a limited number of individuals that any statistical tests can be applied to. 38 specimens were analysed in this study, and to be fair the authors do state in the paper that this is far too small of a sample size for many stat tests to work on, and so they do deliberately choose tests that can be applied to small sample sizes. Still though, the very small number should be taken into account when considering what this study really means for the dinosaur. Additionally, Tyrannosaur specialist Dr. Tom Holtz also points out that the stratigraphy of these specimens needs more work done too, with it not being particularly precise at the moment and therefore making it even harder to accept the proposed time spans of these three species. And of course, there's also the criticism of the paper including specimens in private collections in the analysis, making it more challenging for other paleontologists to access them to test and reproduce their results. Other paleontologists, including Steve Brusatti, are also not convinced that there really is a species-level difference in robusticity, with it still seeming entirely plausible that it's just natural variation within one species, T. rex. 
In this case, there's actually more of a continuum of robusticity among these animals, instead of two distinct clusters. Indeed, previous studies have actually found there to be such a continuous distribution with no obvious split, seemingly conflicting with these new results. A recent paper by paleontologist Thomas Carr has also analysed hundreds of different characters between 44 specimens of Tyrannosaurus in order to try to establish relationships between them, and although some clusters of similar specimens were identified, they were not the same as the groups found in this new study, so there's more conflicting evidence. The fact that more than just two characters were used in this other study also makes it seem a lot more reliable than the new research. So, all in all, it doesn't seem like a very convincing argument has been made in this paper. My personal feelings, which seem to reflect the opinions of a lot of other paleontologists, are that, in principle, it's not an unreasonable claim to have multiple species of Tyrannosaurus that existed at one point or another throughout the stratigraphic range of this genus. However, the evidence given in this paper for these particular species is just really not very good at all. Much more work is definitely required to make a compelling case for a multi-species Tyrannosaurus, and unfortunately it just doesn't seem like this paper does enough. I also feel conflicted about its overall usefulness in general. On the one hand, it can be considered a good starting point for a serious discussion and future work to be done on this idea, as well as bringing more attention to the eternal problem of what we even define as a species in the fossil record. But then, on the other hand, it's almost certainly going to trigger a reply paper that refutes everything stated in it and create a nice taxonomic mess for everyone. Plus, I sort of get the feeling that the amount of media attention such research is always bound to get may have been an influencing factor on its publication, but that might be unfair to say, I don't know for sure. The authors do write in the paper that they fully expect other paleontologists to variously accept or reject these new species when analysing tyrannosaurs in their studies, and that it's their hope that this work can act as a way to frame the issue and be built upon in the future to determine if multiple species were actually present. Anyway, yeah, certainly an interesting yet flawed paper that has already caused a lot of discussion online. It's always quite funny to see people lose their minds over T-Rex though, so there's that at least. What the future of these proposed species holds remains to be seen, but I have a feeling they likely won't be around for long. But then again, maybe I'll be surprised and some really solid evidence ends up being discovered. We'll just have to wait and see. Do let me know what you think about this paper in the comments below, I'm very interested to see what everyone thinks about it. Thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters too, especially our Dinosaur Tier supporters Amanda von Nordek, Archianthus, Brent Furman, Clara Middleton, Dhruv Srivastava, George Vojtek, Just F. Max, Corey Peterson, Loxie Poo, Mike Pace, Nicole Bueno, Persian Boy, Robert Thomas, and Steve Bradshaw. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.